everyone, welcome to ABP Live. I have with me today Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. He has been India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia twice and also in Oman. He's also been the ambassador to UAE. He also has a book on West Asia. He's known as to be the ex West Asia expert. Today we are going to understand from him what are the tensions um, that, uh, that is uh, sort of unfolding between Iran and Israel and how does it entail for the global economy, of course, uh, what impact it will have in India. Welcome to ABP Live, sir, and thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, so my first question to you will be, if you can explain uh, what is this tension that has unfolded between uh, Israel and Iran? It has been brewing for some time. But the immediate catalyst is a series of events that took place in March. Steadily, Netanyahu sensed that he was getting more and more isolated. Mm -hmm. The Americans had turned against him. Kamala Harris had made statements calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, then majority leader, Senator uh, Schumer, had said that he's a liability to Israeli politics and should step down. The Americans did not uh, uh, oppose the UN resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. And Biden was already indicating that he is extremely upset with this mindless slaughter that is taking place. The final straw was the killing of those aid workers uh, in the World Kitchen. And, uh, and uh, that created a storm in Washington. Biden said that he is heartbroken. Netanyahu realized that the only way he can save himself and his agenda is to shift the attention to Iran. Deliberately and calculatedly, he then assaulted the Iranian embassy in Damascus and very consciously killed seven senior officers, of whom two are generals, realizing that now the attention will shift to Iran and that Gaza will go on to the back burner. Exactly that happened. The Americans stopped talking about humanitarian assistance, stopped, stopped talking about an immediate ceasefire, shifted to Iran. The CENTCOM chief arrives uh, uh, in Tel Aviv to, for a conversation, not about humanitarian assistance, but he starts talking about coordinating uh, military response in the case of uh, an Iranian attack. So Netanyahu uh, got his agenda clearly through. Iran was, he has always maintained the issue in the region is not Palestine, it is Iran. And Iran is a button that once you press it, the Americans respond in the way they do. Mm -hmm. That they immediately focus attention on Iran. Now, what the Iranians have done is deliberately and calculatedly respond to this provocation, conscious provocation. Did Netanyahu want an all-out war? I don't know. What he did want is to, uh, is to shift attention, which he did. What the Iranians did, they took 13 days to respond. Gave advance information to the United States through Turkey, talked to various people, and then deliberately and calculatedly responded, not with a view to causing damage in Israel and provoking further retaliation, but indicating a capacity uh, that they have shown that they have this kind of capacity, a capacity demonstration. I think they have been remarkably successful in this regard. Mm -hmm. Today, Netanyahu is in a dilemma. Everyone else has counseled restraint. The Americans have said, you won, move on. All of them know full well that this is a capacity demonstration. It is not the full might of the Iranian capacity. They have shown how they can penetrate the Iron Dome. And they have hit calculatedly only one target. Mm -hmm. And that is the Nevatim air base from where the planes had taken off to kill the Iranians in Damascus. Mm -hmm. A very calculated threat. And that had penetrated the drone. That, what have the Iranians indicated? They have the capacity to launch attacks all the way into Israeli territory. 
they can they can calibrate the nature and the quantum of the attack they also have the capacity to penetrate the iron uh, drum uh, the iron dome this message has gone whatever is the public posturing a very clear message of a very strong possibility of escalation has gone through a message to the israelis that you should not provoke us further because you will escalate matters. Mm -hmm. So, but then uh, what Israel has said, two things, and I just wanted to get that uh, clear from your assessment, is that A, uh, they have not taken responsibility of the attack that has happened at the you know, Damascus consulate. They keep on saying that it was not the same building. Secondly, after the attacks uh, that happened on Saturday night, they said that uh, Israeli, uh, we were able to, you know, uh, uh, kind of check each and every missile that came and the Iron Dome was hugely successful. Uh, none of the missiles could, uh, you know, hit the target. Uh, what do you have to say to that? I have to say the following. You know, along with the war, there is an information war, mm. a war for the minds and hearts. A, of your own people, and B, of your allies. And you also want to give messages to your enemies. So there's an information war. And let us accept the fact that the information war is as significant as the real war. And that very often, governments have the desire to convert black into white for their own advantage. Now, let us be very clear about two or three things. The, Iran, the mission, the building that was attacked was diplomatic premises. The board said very clearly, Iranian embassy, consular section, two buildings side by side. And because the consular section has a very large number of, uh, of public, uh, large sections of the, of the public visiting you, most countries have a separate building or certainly a separate area mm -hmm. in their embassy uh, for the consular section. It was the consular section. Now, they are saying it was their military headquarters planning attacks on Iran. With deep respect, which embassy in the world does not have an intelligence section? Mm -hmm. Which embassy in the world does not have, general, have military personnel? Which embassy in the world does not have dirty tricks being planned? So, this kind of statement is nonsensical. It was diplomatic premises, it was done calculatedly, and it was meant to shift attention from Gaza onto Iran. So it was entirely a very cynical initiative on the part of the Israeli Prime Minister for his own political interest, and I would say political survival. With regard to what has happened, Israel can say what it wishes. All of us know certain facts. More than 300 weapons were directed at Israel. Most of them, the most of them were primitive. <laughs> they took hours to reach. Advance notice had been given and each of them was, most of them were taken out. Certain others were slightly superior in technology. They reached Israeli targets, Israeli territory and they were taken out. Mm -hmm. Only a few were meant to break the Iron Dome, which they did. It was a demonstration which has been remarkably successful. That is why the Israelis are perturbed. The reason you are listening to this whole cacophony of retaliation is because if the Israelis remain quiet, the region knows that the Israelis are vulnerable and this Iron Dome is fragile and can be penetrated. Mm -hmm. These are, this is a demonstration. I've called it a capability demonstration, a technology demonstration. Those who need to know, know. For the rest, it is misinformation or disinformation, which is what countries do during conflict. So, but do you think that Israel will actually retaliate after this? Because why am I asking this is the first time Iran uh, has come out of the so-called shadow war and, and has launched a direct, direct attack. Uh, and if you think Israel will do a retaliatory action, how do you think and when do you think they'll be doing it? <laughs> well, let me be a crystal gazer now. This is being discussed and debated in Tel Aviv, 
with the American general is still there, the CENTCOM general is still there, Kurila. I'm sure the Americans are putting tremendous political pressure on Netanyahu. There is also conversation between Netanyahu and his armed forces personnel. Each of there are there is the political aspect and there is a military aspect. Mm -hmm. The political aspect is overwhelmingly domestic in character, but also it would like to signal a certain message within the region. Why we think there could be some sort of Israeli response is because Israel would not like this week to end on a, on a note which shows it to be fragile and vulnerable. Israel has maintained a strategic superiority in the region consistently from 1967 till today. That is essential. They believe that they are small, mm -hmm. that they are fragile, they are in a hostile neighborhood and therefore they need to not only be structural, uh, strategically superior, it must be clear to their neighbors particularly sections that don't wish them well, that they are, they are superior and capable of inflicting extraordinary damage on their interlocutors. This is, the, it is necessary for them. Now, the question arises, so what next? That's what everybody is asking. Mm -hmm. What next? And also, sir, Israel opposition parties are not much keen on retaliatory action is what I'm In reading. the United in as far as Israel is concerned, there is no opposition party it is a, it's a broadly a government of national unity. Mm -hmm. Benny Gantz is part of it. I'm not sure that the opposition parties uh, of Yer Lapid, etc., on certain core issues are particularly far away from the Likud government, Likud-led mm -hmm. government. If they have differences, the differences are on domestic issues. I'm sure that there is a centre-right and centre-and-left they have differences from Netanyahu and the extremists who are part of his cabinet, but those are on overwhelmingly domestic issues, particularly judicial, mm. in judicial reform. With regard to Palestinian aspirations, particularly Gaza and the future of Hamas, I think there is, as of now, a broad consensus. Mm -hmm. So now what is being discussed? What is being discussed is what next? The Americans, the French, the Germans, and most have counseled restraint. Because what happens on such occasions is this tit-for-tat action keeps on escalating. It becomes incremental. Mm -hmm. And as it becomes incremental, you start getting nearer to something you don't want to do. And that is flee a sleepwalk into war, mm -hmm. like it happened with the First World War and many other wars right. uh, which have happened. With very rare exceptions over the last century, most wars was, were initiated with the, with the idea that it would be over in three to six months. And they've lasted decades, years and years. The Americans went into Afghanistan, they, uh, they went into Iraq. Did they ever be, imagine they would be there for two decades and then come out very badly? It's very easy to start a war. Extremely difficult to know how long it will last and you'd never, never know how it will end. My own sense is that to safeguard their face and promote Netanyahu's personal interest, some short, sharp retaliation is likely, most probably against Hezbollah assets in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Why Hezbollah? Because you don't have to cross any other territory. Right. Hezbollah is already uh, demonized. America is also the part of the is the Iranian coalition, Shia, Shia coalition. This is something that the Israelis despise and have led frequent assaults upon them. They have also provoked the Israelis with their shower of missiles and drones. So my, if you ask me, though no one has any means of knowing, looking at the objective scenario, I do not believe that over that the Israelis will remain totally silent. Now, the question that we need to address is how lethal will be the counterattack? If the Israelis mounted a short, sharp assault, clearly military in character, addressing certain military assets, quite possibly that would be the last word. The Iranians had said, 
after their attack that as far as we are concerned, we have demonstrated our capacity and let's end it there. Mm. If the Israelis continue, I would imagine that the, the best thing that would be, though I am opposed to it, would be a short, sharp attack. But is that likely? Suppose you extend this and you have, you open a new front in Lebanon and then support a very major military attack and there is a response from there and large numbers of casualties take place. Civilians are assaulted as in the case of Gaza. Can the region remain completely silent? That would be my question. Mm -hmm. Therefore, yes, these are the issues that Israel is discussing as you and I speak. And this is what the Americans are part of. By the way, the general is sitting there. Yes. So, I would imagine that I would, I would find it very difficult to summarize. I would find it very difficult to believe that Israel will not respond. But I think that the generals would advise uh, Nathan Yahudo. So far, they have not shown any significant wisdom. They have given uh, superior, uh, they have bowed down to the diktat of the political leadership. They have gone into Gaza with no strategy, no end in view, already have been there for uh, over six months and have nothing to show for their assault except the murder of 33,000 people, including 15,000 children. This is not a military operation. This is a massacre. Mm -hmm. And they have not shown any great military achievement on the ground. They keep on talking, but they are losing people as well. Mm -hmm. And people will tell me that the numbers of casualties they have had are far more than what has been published so far. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would think that the military should show wisdom now. They should tell their political leader whose primary interest, indeed I would say to you, sole interest has been his survival. Mm -hmm. And that is not what Israel is all about. The armed forces are not to prop up the, uh, the fortunes of uh, an extremist prime minister who is going very slowly but very surely berserk. Mm -hmm. uh, Ahmed, now let me ask you uh, the, the dynamics within West Asia as such because you know you had uh, written this book West Asia at war long back before all this started. But we saw recently when this attacks happened uh, between, I mean, when Israel attacked, uh, Iran attacked Israel, um, there was this reports coming up now that Jordan played a very crucial role in the sense supporting the, you know, the US Air Force, the Israeli Air Force in terms of, you know, catching the, the drones and the missiles that are this being shot by Iran. This is part of misinformation that I mentioned. What Jordan did was to take out the drones that were landing on their territory. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they were fighting on behalf of Israel. As you know, the drones, not all of them reached Israel. Mm -hmm. They were, some of them fell short. Some of them came into Jordan. Jordan is therefore, it has played a role which is being played up mm -hmm. in a, that this was an Arab, Israeli, um, Western, coalition yeah, against I mean, the uh, extremist is Islam. Attack. That yes. is what they are mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Jordan has been very, has been a very harsh critic mm -hmm. of Israel, has been a very harsh critic of what is taking place in Gaza. Do recall the majority population of Jordan is Palestinian mm -hmm. and has been very sensitive about the Palestinians. Taking out a few drones which are going to land in your own territory does not make you an ally of Israel. And how do you see Saudi Arabia's role in all of this? Because Saudi their Arabia's statement role was quite, has been uh, very measured over the last six months, very measured. They have not taken sides at all. No, they have taken sides. Mm -hmm. They have taken is very it? harsh side against Israel. What they have no, not done is they have not talked the belligerent language of military action. Their role is overwhelmingly diplomatic. Mm -hmm. What they have done is, they have convened the Arab League meetings, they have convened the OIC meetings, they have gone, uh, they have led delegations to other countries to rouse interest in calling for an immediate ceasefire. Okay. So I think they have done their job pretty well. The UAE has been active 
in the United Nations because they are a member of the Security Council and they have done their job from time to time, hmm. initiated resolutions and have supported. The Arab world has done what it can do in these circumstances and that is to play a very significant diplomatic role. Do recall here that the overwhelming majority of people across the Arab world from Morocco to Yemen support the Palestinian cause. And therefore, even if some governments were to wobble, there is no way they are going. Their survival would demand total support for the Palestinians, which has been manifested up to now. Mm -hmm. So now coming to the fact that what um, statements that India had been talking about, uh, we saw the uh, the statement issued by the Ministry of External Affairs and uh, the the Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Jay Shankar, talked about the fact that how this, if this escalates, it can become dangerous for the global economy and particularly for India because our shipping lanes pass through it, we get the oil from there. So how do you see the impact on Indian economy as such, on oil supplies and other things? It is not just the Houthis and the Red Sea. If there is a regional conflagration, crucial Indian interests will be very severely affected. Number one, energy supplies. Number two, trade and investment. Number th And number three, our community. We, successive governments in New Delhi have been extremely sensitive about the welfare of our people. Mm -hmm. It would not be an exaggeration on my part to say that if you have a regional conflict in West Asia, in the Arabian Peninsula, several hundred Indians will be killed in the crossfire. Let us be very clear about it. Now comes the other things. People ask me, may, may I make one statement of a general character? Mm -hmm. India cannot be peaceful if its neighborhood is aflame. It is not something happening far away. It's close to home. Exactly. In fact, it is our extended, we call it extended neighborhood. I would say to you, it's our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I have eight and a half million people living there. I get 80% of my oil from there and 50% of my gas resources. I get several billion dollars worth of remittances. Every individual working in the Gulf looks after four to five people at home. So we, our interests will be very crucially, adversely affected. And therefore I have said, uh, of course there is, uh, I'm in an echo chamber where the, my own words come back to me and no one listens to them. Long ago, we should have been active role players mm -hmm. in the with our diplomatic acumen and our long history with this region. Many years ago, we should have been role players in the promotion of peace and stability in the region. But that has not happened. It's not likely to happen. So let's move on. Your question specific, will it affect India? I think it will affect India very seriously, not just India, the world economy. Because this is the principal soul or source of oil and gas for the international economy. These are major trade partners. So it's not, and it's not just India. It affects all the other Asian countries as well. And I would say to you, even European countries. Mm -hmm. America is to a large extent uh, cut off because it can, any time it wishes, it becomes fortress America. Mm -hmm. So, but then let me also ask you uh, if, you know, if, as you rightly said, we have so much of interest that we need to safeguard and which is, you know, right now in a lot of crisis, don't you think India should now probably play the role uh, in the West Asia that it needed to, um, See, this in is, the sense what China did, uh, you know, This is a Shma. wish that diplomats have had, academics have had. And media persons have had. Mm -hmm. The one entity that has never bought it is the government of the day. Whether it was the Dr. Manmohan Singh government earlier or the Modi government now. We, some of us, retired diplomats and uh, with a group, have been writing papers on this subject from 2011. Because we noted that with the American retreat from the region and increasing American loss of credibility, in the region as a security guarantor, opportunities had emerged for other role players 
to promote peace and stability in the region diplomatically through diplomatic initiatives particularly a role by countries that have a crucial interest in the welfare of the region that's how we started and we started looking at asian partners who would be with us and each on china japan korea indonesia malaysia what have you the partners are not important india was to be the leader and i truly believed that the joint statements that our prime minister concluded during his visits to the gulf and their return visit each and every one of them spoke of india strategic partnership mm -hmm. india's crucial interest and the indication from the region that they are looking forward to a major to a major indian role in promoting peace and stability but all of that was just verbiage it never got translated and i would say to you frankly uh, since 2019 i have not seen even minimal interest on india's part to play a constructive diplomatic role uh, either on its own or with the support of certain other asian countries to promote peace and stability i don't think at this stage in the midst of conflict you can shape a role mm -hmm. this is something you have to plan very carefully you must mobilize the uh, right uh, countries that think like you you have to work at it you have you can't do this just overnight oh because you saw a conflagration then you are a firefighter i'm not talking about firefighter i'm mm -hmm. talking about a long term diplomatic initiative i have not seen this emerging from any source for a very long time so this our we abdicated this space and china in some shape or form entered that space and was supportive and then facilitated the saudi iranian uh, peace arrangement Mm -hmm. so but then what partner. will you say to some of the initiatives that <coughs> india has taken uh, in terms of the chabahar port the international north south corridor or even the you know the i2u2 the imec that recently got signed during the g20 summit i wish i could give you good news chabahar was offered to india in 2003 10 years before belt and road initiative was even talked about by president xi jinping if we had completed our part of the commitment the connectivity to afghanistan the connectivity to central asia mm -hmm. and through bandar abbas at that time the connection to moscow it is president xi jinping who would have come to india and asked us to be partners in the belt and road so that he could coordinate his vision with something that we had achieved on the ground what have you seen actually happening in the last two decades no progress whatsoever so don't mention chabahar at all of anything we have not done anything and now of course chabahar the the, the international north south transit corridor is also from chabahar but we are not doing anything involved we are not involved with any of that now what you have i2u2 i2u2 has been very clearly defined as A, a private sector initiative mm -hmm. where the countries are private sectors of different countries will work together it is an american effort to basically push israel deeper and deeper into the politics and economics of west asia without addressing the palestine issue i don't think it has any future whatsoever certainly it has no strategic value the last one is the most laughable mm -hmm. this is the india a uh, middle east uh, mediterranean corridor again it is the americans forcibly bringing israel as a party to the connectivities that are in west asia we don't need israel we already have very robust connectivities israel can become a party to these connectivities once it has addressed the palestine issue if any if we have learned anything from the gaza war now it's a very harsh reminder given to us by 33000 palestinian dead that their aspirations cannot wither away and you cannot pretend that they uh, that their aspirations can be ignored and you can then come up with all these idiotic proposals which have nothing to do with reality 
Sir, uh, let me now come to another incident that has impacted India directly before this uh, attacks took place is the seizing of the cargo ship in which there were 17 Indian sailors. Now, unfortunately, those Indian sailors are detained in Iran. Uh, it seems that, you know, our embassy officials in Iran will be able to meet them. But what does your assessment say? Do you think uh, the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards, now that they have seized the, the ship, will they be releasing these sailors? Go back a little bit. Iran had announced in February, March that they have seen a large number of ships mm -hmm. with their assets being seized in different places. And they had warned that we will take retaliatory action. They have done that. It happens, this is not an Indian ship. It is not an Indian flagship. It is supposed to be a Portuguese ship. Yes. It is supposed to have assets which are connected with Israel. Mm -hmm. It just happens that Indian sailors are on board. I can assure you, with all emphasis at my command, these Indian sailors will be very well taken care of and sooner rather than later, they will return to India. Okay. Uh, but then if I talk about, that's a, that's a good assessment, sir. But if I can also ask you, in terms of India-Iran ties after this, because the ship was, you know, the destination was Mumbai port, Navasheva, and the fact that uh, there are these questions being raised that why is Iran not releasing them immediately if you're a friend? And we've also stopped taking oil from Iran since 2019, which we have not resumed. Uh, do you think probably now, even if we can't play a bigger role, as you rightly said, as a firefighting measure only, should we start doing that at least to play some role or to douse this <laughs> crisis? I, I Wishful thinking triumphs over reality. Mm -hmm. We all wish so much that I wish my country would do this, I wish my country would do that. And we are constantly disappointed. I, I think what you have said is absolutely accurate. One of the most important relationships for India in our region is Iran. It is a potentially a strategic partner. Its location, its size, its, uh, look, its, uh, its oil and gas resources, the logistical connectivity, India's only principal logistical connectivity projects are through Iran to Afghanistan, Central Asia and Moscow. And yet, isn't it a matter of concern that this is the one relationship that we have deliberately downgraded? We have sacrificed our ties with Iran at the altar of our concerns relating to the U.S. relationship. Uh, now, realistically, I would suggest to you that I can see a degree of I have some understanding of the positions India took in 2004-2005 because we were pushing the nuclear agreement with the Americans and the Americans were xenophobic about Iran and we wouldn't have got the agreement through if we had not uh, gone along with these sanctions, unilateral sanctions that the Americans imposed on Iran. Even then I would have argued that we should have conveyed to the Americans that we too have strategic interests and concerns. Mm. And indeed, you have the good fortune when things go bad to pack up and run away. I can't leave my region. I have strategic ties with Iran that need to be nurtured. But we didn't know that. But what about 2018? The most shameless initiative from the US administration, the unilateral withdrawal from a solemnly concluded nuclear agreement which was sanctioned, further sanctioned by the UN Security Council. A president comes and overnight withdraws from it. Not only does he withdraw the US from it, he imposes fresh sanctions on the Iranians. Don't you believe that that was the time Indian diplomacy should have spoken up sharply to the Americans, conveying to them, you want to build strategic ties with us. You have a long-term vision of your relationship with us, but how come you have no sensitivity whatsoever with regard to our interests and concerns? Should you not be discussing those with us? 
that is what we should have conveyed. And our failure to remain silent at that time, we have paid a heavy price. Iran understands this. I would like to remind you, Iranians have been strategic role players in world affairs for 2,500 years as a people, as an empire. Now, they do not act in haste, nor do they speak out of turn, nor do they use loose language. They are very calculated, as you have seen with regard to the retaliation that I have just discussed with you. The Iranians have observed with concern India's wavering approach to the relationship. Mm. No sense of direction or com genuine commitment. Periodic visits of high-level ministers, but no substance. What have the Iranians done in the meantime? They've moved on, isn't it? They have built up substantial ties with Russia, built up uh, ties with China. They are welcomed into BRICS as well as into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Iran has moved on. Now, if India still continues to engage with them, well and good. But India is so uncertain in terms of its posture and seems to waver so frequently in terms of articulating its interest that if you were sitting in Tehran, please tell me, what would you make of all this? So they have moved on. But as I would still assure you, no harm will come to our sailors. And indeed, I would say to you, they will reach home safe and sound very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so my last question to you, I know you have a busy day ahead, is finally, how do you see um, this tension, uh, you know, spiraling out? Do you think, as you said, that this can be a distraction uh, from the Gaza crisis and people have really stopped talking about Gaza now? Do you think there will be retaliation from Israel, uh, you know, as you also said that there could be, and this will continue, then Iran will again retaliate, or, you know, where, where will it finally end, or will it end at all, or we are seeing a third front the in the war? The problem world. with all analysis, all understanding of complex issues, is to know where to start. The present crisis did not begin on 7th October. Mm -hmm. It's part of a continuum. The... The Iranian retaliation did not happen just out of nowhere on 14th April. There is a background. All of us know what the root causes are. I understand that Israel has certain views and aspirations. I appreciate that. This is their homeland. But the total one-sided support that successive U.S. administrations have given the Israelis, given them a blank check. For the first time, you now find various American sources questioning this. The New York Times, the mouthpiece that is the most supportive of Israel, has written an editorial. Their editorial board has written a joint essay that an American support cannot be a blank check. And it is time for Israel to stop. Enough is enough. The New York Times has said. So these kind of voices have emerged because they are appalled by the widespread killing that the Israelis have done with no purpose. They have got in six months one senior Hamas leader who they say they have killed. That's all. In seven months, in a little, tiny little enclave. So it is the, the actual, the, the control lies in Washington, not in Tel Aviv. It is, this is the moment where Biden should finally emerge as a statesman, not as a pathetic weakling that he has been for so long. So much so that his own party is questioning his fitness to be the next president. And he has got a formidable challenge from Donald Trump. I really wish that. The United States and the US alone can stop Netanyahu. The New York Times has said the only weapon that will be effective against Netanyahu and Israel in general is the immediate suspension of military supplies to Israel. That will 
finally in the cap to now the israelis believe they have a free hand and no one will touch them i think the american opinion is changing and i think they cannot count on that forever this is now the buck lies with biden that is where i would say the first point assuming that biden remains true to form and remains the pathetic individual he has been for so long then you will find the israeli army they are the second they have to speak up now in the past they have done that there have been israeli prime ministers who have wanted for personal advantage certain initiatives taken which would have harmed israel's interests i believe a harsh response to what has happened up to now would escalate matters go beyond uh any political calculation that netanyahu may have for his own interest i think the israeli armed forces should now speak up and tell their prime minister that we don't think israel's interests are served in further escalation if they also fail and remain the mute spectators they have been then you will see i would advocate a very quick short sharp response most probably against hezbollah i am not in favor of it but if it escalates because hezbollah may not countenance casualties they may escalate on their own without iranian involvement they also have assets they also have drones and missiles and they are right next door they don't have several hours like the iranian drones took so i would say that i think this is a golden opportunity for the israeli armed forces led by the us president as their political mentor finally saying this is the time to stop call a halt we've gone nowhere let us look at what can we can do with the day after in gaza and later on with the region in general sure thank you so much ambassador ahmed for that so that was ambassador talmiz ahmed giving us a synopsis of what had happened when iran directly attacked israel and how it was a retaliatory action what israel needs to do and finally the impact that the escalating tensions would have on the global economy and especially on india with sanchit on camera this is naima basu for avp live thank you for watching the interaction Thank you.